I think you have to say, got it? Okay, hi. Am I being heard? Okay. Um, Jill Hyatt is a veteran educator, specializes in helping students find and explore their passions. She just started her 19th year as a gifted enrichment teacher at Crawford Central School District. Um, she has also spent more than 15 years teaching science and creative movement at Creating Landscapes Summer Program at Allegheny College. Um, she has a master's in education from Smith College and a BA from Allegheny College. She resides in Meadville with her husband, two daughters, and in her spare time, she enjoys reading, hiking, paddleboarding, yoga, and modern dance choreography. And just reading that makes me tired. <laughs> um, ladies and gentlemen, Jill Hyatt, please welcome her. Hi, everybody. Can everybody at home hear me okay? Yeah. Yes. I'm afraid if I turn the speaker up, it's going to, you're going to hear a double. That's what was happening when you were talking. Yeah. Okay. Let's. Well, let's see. What... Okay. How does that sound? Is it coming? Is it coming through the speaker or are you just hearing me? Yeah. I'll just project as best I can. How's that? Can you hear me? Yeah, can I, can we get a thumbs up if people at home can hear me? Yes, okay. People at home can hear me. How are you doing with people in the room? Okay, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, like Mary said, my name's Jill Hyatt. I've been a teacher for about 20 years. Um, and in my role as gifted support teacher, um, I teach a lot of different enrichment workshops, everything from creative writing to things about the legal system. Um, I have taught a lot of different topics to seventh and eighth graders around science, but environmental science and ecology is definitely not my area of expertise. So I was super excited um, and have a lot of gratitude for the scholarship to go to the Hog Island Educator Week. Um, this past summer that the Audubon Society provided to me. So thank you. I was in the role of like a beginner's mindset again and um, a learner because this is an area I don't know a lot about. So I have to say I'm a little intimidated um, being invited to your first in-person meeting in over three years because I don't know if I'll have a lot of new um, knowledge to share with this particular audience. I feel like you may know some of this, but I have a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of gratitude. So I'm hoping there'll be um, something new to you. Uh, that's interesting. Sorry, this is Zoom running while my slideshow is running. I just might need a minute with the technology. So um, if anyone's not familiar, Hog Island is right off the coast of Maine. It's about um, a 90 minute drive from Portland along the coast. And so this is a great aerial view that one of our instructors took with his drone. Um, and what I love is only this tip of the island here has cabins and the rest is completely uninhabited. So it was such a wonderful place to be able to explore for the week. Um, and with technology today, all the there were about 40 teachers there and 10 instructors, and we were all able to share photos. So I'm going to share a lot of photos with you today. Um, I did not take most of those. <laughs> there were people there with much better lenses and much better photography skills than me, but they were taken this summer while I was there by some of, um, some of the other educators there. Um, this was a great shot. So there was osprey nesting on the mainland right when we arrived. So this is how I was greeted before we took the boat over to the island. So it was a wonderful way um, to kick off the week um, and a sign of lots of good things to come. And then we took a boat over to the Queen Mary, which is this house here. The bottom part has a lab and the top floor is where I was able to live for the week. Um, and I also put this photo in just because Lee is on the state for, uh, for PA Audubon board. And he told me that he knew a few of you that were on the board here at the Prescott Audubon Society. So he was excited to meet me and wanted to pass on a hello. So I didn't want to forget to do that. I put a picture of him in there. Um, and then th this is our whole crew. There were 40 educators from around the country. Um, 
and most of them with a lot more environmental knowledge than me. And so not only did I learn from the instructors, but I got to learn from a lot of the other educators there as well. Um, and one thing that I appreciated that I wasn't expecting, like I was expecting to learn a lot of new things about birds and the environment, but there was a big focus on social justice and racial justice while I was there that I really wasn't expecting in Maine at an Audubon camp, but was super exciting to me because those are things that are also interesting to me. And it helped me to understand the ways that environmentalism and social justice can intersect that I hadn't thought of before. Um, and so one big takeaway from the camp for me is to pass on to my students that as they become better stewards of the environment, they'll also be doing social justice work. And so I'm gonna share a couple of stories to illustrate that point, how that came up for me. Um, so first of all, the beloved puffins, uh, most of you probably know, um, Hog Island is pretty famous for the puffin project. Can they still hear me at home if I sit over here on the computer? Yeah, yeah, okay. Um, so yeah, so the Puffin Project probably highlighted the trip. Um, we get to take a, a boat trip about 40 um, minutes out to Eastern Egg Rock where the Puffin, one of the sites of the Puffin Restoration Project. And so, um, also, I had never seen seals outside of an aquarium. <laughs> so on the way out, we, oh, it's not, uh-oh. I have lost the connection between the TV and my computer. Sorry guys, technical difficulty. Let me just, um, so it's still saying what you're saying now. So let me show you what's happening. Let me get back in the meeting. <laughs> Like when I click through, it's not. Um, it might be they can see it on the Zoom presentation and not on your screen then. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me try stop Wait share and see. Okay. Yeah. Now. Try disconnecting and reconnecting, or I could try to stop sharing. So, my, my.
there we go. Sorry about that to those of us at home. I apologize. Can they hear me now? Are we good? Yes. Okay. So um, Steve got this idea that maybe if he made decoys and also put mirrors on Eastern egg rock that he could trick the puffins into thinking other puffins were there. And so that's what he did and it worked. Uh, and in 1981, they started breeding there again and um, have continued to over all these years so that there are 1300 pairs of puffins now, um, not only on Eastern Aid Rock, but on a number, a few of the other islands um, nearby there, which is awesome because that is the world's first restoration of a seabird to an island where humans had killed it off. So big accomplishment. They are very proud of it at Hog Island. And so we talked about that a lot. Like I said, we got to take um, a boat trip out and actually see the puffins. It was pretty awesome. Um, but what I learned from one of our instructors that came to talk to us is the story may not have a happy ending because in the summer of 2021, it was the worst breeding season since restoration. And the it rained a lot more. That's so not this past summer, but in 2021, it rained so much that a number of the chicks got hypothermia and died. Also, the fish that were available for the parent puffins were different. The waters um, were warmer. And so they're hypothesizing that the fish that they usually hunt um, went looking for colder waters. And so what was really plentiful were the butterfish. And those fish were too big to fit in the chick's mouths. So they actually, the researchers actually watched the parents bring them back and then the chicks not be able to eat them. So a number of chicks starved. Um, they found a lot of um, uh, carcasses uh, around these islands and it was the lowest chick productivity on record since reestablishment. The good news is that in 2022, this past summer, um, they rebounded. The fish that they normally hunt were plentiful. It, the weather was calmer. Uh, the water um, was not as warm. It was more typical for Maine and they had a much better season this year. So with climate change, they're not sure if 21 was a fluke or we're gonna start seeing more of a pattern. So that was, I mean, it was upsetting to hear about 21, but it was nice to hear that 22 is better. Um, and the person that told me this story um, and has done a lot of work covering the puffins is Derek Johnson, who is a journalist and a photographer. He's in the middle there. He worked for a long time for the Boston Globe. Um, he's now retired, uh, but he still does a lot of work with the puffins. He wrote a book on the puffin project. He has covered them extensively um, for a lot of years. And what was interesting is he gave us a talk on the puffins, um, the story that I just told you and a number of other details, and uh, shared some of his own photography. So the only two pictures in here that weren't taken this summer at our camp is this one, and that's one of his photos. Make sure to give him credit, yeah. <laughs> um, and then one that'll follow this. And so he showed us these amazing pictures, but in his presentation, he interspersed it with um, what are called sacrifice zones, which are neighborhoods in our country. The ones he showed us were primarily in Chicago and Flint, Michigan, where um, a lot of black and Hispanic people live that are suffering from pollution way more than other neighborhoods. And the reason that um, journalists have call started calling them sacrifice zones. Yeah, <laughs> that was awesome. Um, the reason journalists have started calling them sacrifice zones is because richer um, and more white neighborhoods have started petitioning not to have certain factories that are high pollutants in their neighborhoods. And so they get moved to other neighborhoods that are poor um, where there's higher minority populations, which um, the neighborhood in Chicago he told us about has like neurotoxic manganese dust in the air from the, they're doing oil, it's an oil refinery and the byproducts are causing a lot of air pollution. I'm sure you've heard about in Flint, Michigan, uh, the issues with the lead in the water. And what he talked about was for many years, he covered these issues as social justice issues separate from environmental issues. Um, but with climate change, it's becoming part of the same problem. 
And that I heard somebody up here ask, like, can anyone go to Eastern Egg Rock? Yes, it's actually become a really big tourist thing up in Maine. So they take us, if we go to the Hog Island camp, they always take the campers there. But you can go to other places along the coast of Maine and um, go see it. It's become a big tourist thing. And um, Mr. Johnson made the point that we need people to be equally interested in the plight of people um, that are facing pollution in these neighborhoods, particularly when it's being targeted to particular neighborhoods. Um, because, and this was his quote that I just thought really explained it. Curbing carbon pollution for families in Chicago calms the climactic conditions that drive fish away from puffins. Every new wind turbine and solar panel installed is one less mountain of fossil fuel waste fouling city blocks and rural rivers and one less set of emissions inflaming the ocean. Right. So some of these same issues that are harming people um, are harming the puffins. And I hadn't thought of those issues connected in the same way. So that was really interesting to me. Um, he was not the only teacher there that helped me see these connections. Um, we also one of our instructors was Dr. Camille Gamer. She's a professor at Penn State University. And then prior to working at Penn State, she was at the University of Pennsylvania for a couple of years. And she does algae research. Um, primarily on coral reefs. So it was really interesting to hear about some of her research. Um, and also she started a nonprofit called Black and Marine Science. So she talked to us about her work with algae and how studying algae helps her under learn about the health of coral reefs. Um, but she also talked uh, to us um, about how being a black woman, she is a big minority in the field that she works in and how alienating it can feel at work to um, be the only person of color in her field. So she started a nonprofit partially so she could connect with other um, people of color in the field of uh, marine science, but also that, so she could encourage other uh, students that might be considering going into the field um, to go into the field. And she talked about that many minorities live in inner cities where they don't have regular exposure to oceans and sometimes even to swimming. And she grew up in Philadelphia, but was really lucky that her mom took her to the Y and took her swimming and she loved swimming. And so she also loved science. And when she went to college, she realized if she studied marine biology, she could also snorkel and scuba dive as part of her work. <laughs> so that's how she connected those things. And so she, um, in addition to her work, uh, her science work has made it a big mission to um, do work for her nonprofit. And the nonprofit um, also has an educational mission. So they have a YouTube channel where different scientists put out like two and three minute videos about different marine science topics for kids. They actually have an adult version and a kid version. So that wasn't a great resource to learn as a teacher because those are um, in just the size and um, level that the students I'm working with can digest. So she shared a great resource with us. And then the workshop she did with us was probably my second favorite there only to the puffins, which was exploring the inner tidal zone. So having never been to Maine, um, or really, yes, really any beaches that had such a rocky coast. <laughs> I really wasn't familiar with the intertidal zone and the ecology and the ecosystem of the intertidal zone. So that was a new thing um, that I was able to learn there. One thing that I didn't know, like I spent more time at like Virginia Beach and beaches in North Carolina, where when the tide comes in and out, that tidal zone might be four feet, six feet. Um, in Maine, it ranges from eight and a half feet to 18 feet. So it's such a bigger area um, for these ecosystems that are so specially adapted to being in water half the time and out of water half the time, especially in that upper part of the inner tidal zone. Um, and then in the rocky areas, there's tide pools where some of the creatures um, and organisms do get to stay in the water. And it was wonderful because we did have a little talk before we went out, but we spent about three hours out here and we could explore and find what was interesting to us. But there were all these expert teachers walking around that we could, once we found something, we could say, hey, what is this? Tell us about it. Um, so Dr. Camille and about five of her other colleagues um, were able to do that for us. So in some of the high tide pools, there were um, mollusks and limpets and barnacles, um, different things that need, it's not switching again. It's something about when I take too long to switch. 
You can see them. I'm sorry, guys, to have the technology cut out, but it should be faster. All right. I think the lesson here is I have to click through the slides faster. <laughs> No, I don't know why it keeps trying to connect to a mobile device. What did, how do we fix that last time? Started to do that and then we did something. Like well, I think this time I'm not going to share in the meeting and see if that makes it stop happening. Yeah. Okay. I am not sharing in the meeting right now. So maybe we can put the computer, your computer. Yeah, on the computer screen, I see your reports open. Right. <laughs> so is there a way you can put your computer screen so that they can see that? I think I, I think you might be right that something about sharing in the meeting well, is. Your... Oh, that way it's still sharing from yours instead of that big screen. As an aside, uh, those of us that taught in public school had to do this for about a year and a half during pandemic because, <laughs> because half of our school and half of them were at home um, and it's honestly not that hard if you're just teaching to the people at home or you're just teaching to the people in the room but doing both at once just presents so many problems <laughs> So, oh, if I stop my video, yeah. So that they're not just seeing my torso. Do we do that? Okay. That should show up better when I return to slideshow. You can go ahead and. Cool. Yeah. Do you know how to pin pin the main screen? Yeah. Yeah, I they should yeah, they can see it now at home. I think They can see at home. Yeah, we're good. We're good for now. Yeah, no, you have to leave it there. <laughs> <laughs> 
you have to leave it just how you no what i'm saying no you're good okay sorry hopefully that will be the last tech issue i'll just have to go through my <laughs> slides a little faster <laughs> inner tighter pool title pools one of the thing we saw <laughs> um were a lot of barnacles um yeah so these what you're seeing along the sides there are all barnacles and then there's the actual mollusks that were attached and a little bit of algae there. And then this is one of the few pictures I took myself because in the middle of the screen here, the anemone. Yeah, which was pretty, that was one of the more exciting finds of the morning along with a number of different kinds of algae. Yes, yes. And this is like, I tried like 10 different photos and that was the most expanded. It expanded more, but I couldn't capture it, right? So it's about halfway contracted right there. Um, but it was pretty cool, like in the rocks in that tidal pool to get to see that sea anemone. Yeah, that was a highlight for sure. Um, and then we did a lot of algae collection and they taught us how to do algae pressing. So like the way you can do flower pressing, um, we did with the algae, although this particular type because it has so much air in there and sometimes water was not great for pressing, <laughs> but it was, yeah. Um, so this, these were our 10 instructors there. And when I was saying that they went out of their way to make a focus on racial justice, you can see um, that there's a lot of diversity among the staff there. Um, but you can see around the room here, and I think it's from what I've been told pretty true about Audubon societies around the country, that is not the norm. So they went out of their way to bring different instructors so that we would get different viewpoints. Um, and it was just, it was really exciting for me to see how excited the instructors of color were to have that many of them there because they never see that in their workplaces. And they were so excited to support each other and hear about each other's research. That was pretty awesome. <laughs> and then the third instructor that I learned so much from, um, his name was Ted. He's been a longtime instructor there. He lives in Illinois, but comes in in the summers. And he just really embodied the way I want to be with students um, when I'm doing environmental work. He was so present and mindful and noticed everything. I chose this picture of him with the binoculars because the first day we were going out for a long hike, there were, and so there's 40 of us out there. I hadn't met him yet. I hadn't had long conversation with him. Um, and I'm not a big birder. Like I had to borrow a friend's binoculars to go to this camp. Like I'm excited to learn, I'm new to this. Um, but he came over and he said, oh, are those your binoculars? And I said, well, yeah, I borrowed, I borrowed them from a friend, but that's what I'm gonna use. Um, I'm gonna, yeah. That is a rose-breasted grosbeak. Yeah, grosbeak. Yeah. I've heard that at home, people are only seeing the tiny little screen and there's a big echo. So let me try. Oh, you didn't mute it. Yeah. So yours is muted? Yeah. It's because the computer's too close. So go ahead and take yours back. No, I mean all the way to the back of the room. Jen was right. Let's try this. This is going to be one tech problem after another. I can tell this story while I'm fixing this, I think. We'll see. Um, I need to unpin Sue. Go back to her square to unpin her. Yeah. Oh, in her small square, not her big square. Thank you. Oh, but it's saying she's not. So now I did pin her. Let me unpin her. If 
I just pin myself at a one pin. <laughs> And then do this. And then what I'm wanting is for them to be able to see it now. Mm -hmm. Oh, I know. Hold on. Move it up a little. No. 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 You're right. I do. Thank you. <laughs> Think. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. All right, so can the people at home see this better than before? <laughs> ask them, can you just ask somebody? So, so I've changed it since I talked to your husband. I'm going to talk a little bit and can you chat with, yeah. From who? There's an option to remove pin. Would that do anything? Yeah. Yeah, remove that. Okay. There we go. Okay. <laughs> so my story about the binoculars is he comes over, he asks me, are these your binoculars? I say, I borrowed them from a friend. And he says, oh, well, the I, this is, these are old. And this eyepiece doesn't work well with glasses. And you're not going to be able to see much. And do you want to borrow mine for the day? We can trade. Oh, wow. Right? So the fact that I didn't know him and he's watching a group of 40 people and he noticed that. And that was kind of what he brought to everything with us for the week. Um, and so it reminded me something I know as a teacher, but sometimes I can forget. It's not just the content, it's the manner. It's that in how we present things. And he just kept presenting um, that example. So this is the rose breasted gross beef. <laughs> and so um, one bird, he did a very short workshop around doing birding with small children. And he said, you know, sometimes you'll get those exact conditions where everyone's quiet enough and you will see some birds close enough. But most times that's not going to happen with a small group of children. And so one thing that you can do is have cutouts of certain types of birds and put them where the children are likely to see those birds. Right? Are they are they ones that are on the ground in the brush? Are they ones that are typically halfway up the tree? And so then you can teach the kids where to look for different birds. Um, and these are just, you know little things like that I would not have thought of. Um, so that was really useful. Uh, they did have a number of goldenrod fields on the island, so that was pretty cool. We were just we were a little past when most of the monarchs had hatched, but a few of them. We're still hanging around. Um, and even just how to approach the monarch so that they didn't fly away and we could see them up front. Like, seems like common sense. Maybe I should have known this, but he would say, stop about as far as I am from you and just wait, wait like a full minute, be totally silent, breathe, observe it, and then decrease your distance by about half. And then stop for another minute. And not only did the butterfly not fly away, but I'm observing way longer than I may have, and definitely longer than my students um, would if I didn't give them those exact instructions. And so then I was able to get like within a foot before the butterfly was startled. So um, yeah, that was really great. Um, we did, we went back to the mainland one time to do some pond studies. So some freshwater studies. Um, and I've done some of this because um, French Creek is in Meville where I live. 
Um, and we're really fortunate, uh, Allegheny College is there and there's a program called Creek Connections, uh, which does a lot of stream studies with students. So um, even though I haven't led those programs, I've participated in them and just really small things like we usually collect these creek samples and we put them in these plastic bins and we're looking for like mi micro invertebrates and macro invertebrates. So they're really small, right? And we're using magnifying glasses. They're hard to see. Like he's like, use white porcelain bowls because then they pop out and they're so much easier to see. So something I took back. And then similarly, he did an evening workshop for us. And insects always uh, come around the light. He's like, put the light behind a white sheet because then you know, they're dark and you're gonna be able to see them so much better and they're gonna spread out a little more. Um, and so different techniques like that were really useful to me as a mid-career teacher, but very new at doing environmental work for students. Um, I am a big hiker and I always try to do a five senses meditation um, when I'm hiking. Like when I'm out, I try at some point to stop and like, what do I, usually it's four senses. There's not usually much I taste, <laughs> but I do try to stop and what do I hear and what do I see and what do I smell and what can I feel? Um, and this was the best example. Uh, there was this fern field on one of our hikes and the ferns came up to like shoulder height. And there was one path through the middle, so we didn't have to like brush through them, but the smell, it was like fresh meat. Um, and it was just so overwhelming. And usually I have to really struggle when I'm doing my sense meditations hiking, but this, it was just like, because it was such a big field, the overwhelming smell. And again, with the teachers guiding us to like pay attention to that, um, then for more of the hike, I was stopping and um, touching leaves on different things and smelling, which I hadn't, hadn't thought of before. But yeah. And these were really busy days when we were at Hog Island. They had activities for us from about 7.30 a.m. till 9 p.m. <laughs> um, and they, but they tried to build in an hour or two sometime during the day for a little bit of downtime and reflection, which I really appreciated, especially along the coast. Um, and then we also had workshops about how to do this downtime and reflecting with students. Um, and some of the teachers shared their journals with us with particular prompts. So write about what you're seeing. Um, why is that important? What does it mean? And what kind of action might you wanna do in the future? So these prompts were helpful to me um, and we had some great artists there that shared, shared their work as well. Um, one thing that Hog Island does is has an artist in residence every summer. So there was an artist in residence that talked to us that mostly specializes in drawing specimens, which was, I thought was, yeah, different. You don't hear that a lot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But she was like 25. And so it was just, I don't, I guess I have a stereotype in my head that like younger kids don't still want to do that work, but she was super excited about it. She had worked um, for a year or two in Australia and had the opportunity to do some taxidermy. She mostly specialized in drawing specimens, um, but she talked about how taxidermy really just took the 2D art to the 3D level. Um, so that was pretty interesting. Um, and I notice, I wonder, what does this remind me of? Encouraging students to draw. So I have been co-teaching an English class for seventh graders for about six years. And today was the first day um, that we ever took them outside for a lesson. In our schools, it is not part of our curriculum. In our schools, and I have been reading up on this, many schools in the country, there's no required environmental science for high school students. Um, Ecology is actually a very small part of the biology curriculum. It's a lot focused on cell, bi cell biology, um, genetics, things that are important, uh, but it, it's just really overlooked. Um, so we don't work it in because it's not in the curriculum that we're handed. So I was like, okay, even if it's not directly in the curriculum that we're handed, how can we work this in? So it's the beginning of the year. We're just teaching the kids about the scientific method, right? Like what are good testable questions to ask if you're constructing an experiment. Uh, how do you frame hypothesis? These are 12 year olds, they've never done any lab science. You know, what are 
uh, dependent and independent variables. So we went outside and we started with this, what do you notice and what do you wonder? Luckily we have a creek and we have some hiking trails very close to our school. And again, now I'm thinking, why don't we take advantage of that? Why aren't we out there all the time? Um, and it's so easy to say, well, it's not in our curriculum. So we just started with, I notice and I wonder and, and had them write some things. But then we additionally said, well, what testable problems could you come up with based on what you wonder? Right. And some of them wanted to know about like why mushrooms were growing in certain areas and not others. Um, how the water level in the creek would affect the number of organisms in the creek. Um, and it's really exciting for me because we don't ask kids to come up with those kinds of questions enough. Right. We're handing content to them. And this was like 25 minutes outside <laughs> with a group of 12 year olds. So that's. Um, that's a big thing I took away from being at Hog Island that I will incorporate more of. Um, and the rest of these are just some of my favorite photos, things I was excited about. Um, this is beard lichen, sometimes called, called old man's moss, which I learned it's not moss, it's a lichen, <laughs> um, but often in the trees. And then, does anybody know this one? Yeah. So that was really fascinating to me because we pointed this out to our instructor when we were on a mushroom walk and we're like, oh, this is definitely a kind of fungi. And he said, no, that's a plant. And we're like, there's no way that's a plant. So, you know, another new interesting thing for me to learn that like, yeah, they don't photosynthesize. So they get their nutrients through a mutual relationship with fungi through their roots. Um, but they are actually considered, they are actually a plant, not a fungi. Um, Indian pipe. Is that nice? Yeah, Indian pipe, sometimes, sometimes ghost pipe. Yeah. So they're, yeah, they are a plant, but they don't have chlorophyll and they don't photosynthesize. Um, I do have which um, the fungi that they have to be in relationship with is Rucella and Lactarius. Um, those are the two fungi that they're in relationship with through their root systems. Um, but I don't know then how they would be classified. Questions? Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between a moss and a lichen? Um, can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. She said, what's the difference between a moss and a lichen? So a lichen is actually a partnership between an algae, algae and fungi. Um, whereas moss is not. Yeah. <laughs> it's not. It's, it's not it's a whole different category, the moss category. Um, so while I share just a few more of my favorite photos with you, um, I want to say thank you for the scholarship to go to the camp. I had an incredible experience there um, from everything to the like homemade local foods <laughs> that they made for us to the different workshops. And I only talked about a few of them. I took a photography workshop, a storytelling workshop. Um, like I said, the fungi hike, there was a number of things um, to the people that I got to know that I feel like enriched me so much learning about what they do and how they teach. Also as a mother of two, it was a very rare opportunity to have someone make meals for me and plan the whole day for me. I haven't been on a vacation without my kids in 16 years. So I really appreciated that opportunity as well. Um, and it made me really able to soak in uh, not only the recreational parts of it, uh, but the learning that I can carry back to my students. And so I learned a lot of lessons there. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, uh, one of the biggest for me at this, I, I just think at this stage in our Earth's climate crisis, the environmental crisis that we're at, um, the fact that social justice and environmental, environmentalism are so intertwined. Um, and that as a teacher, I feel like the biggest role I can play in, in helping take action for that in my environmental crisis is teaching my students about these topics in a way that's gonna make them care and wanna be stewards of the environment. And I think one important way to start to do that is to create more opportunities for them 
to slow down, spend some time in nature and have positive experiences in the natural world, much like I did at Hog Island. This was a fun one. These were s'mores 2.0. <laughs> so, we had a bonfire on the, yeah we had a bonfire on the beach and then like every variation you could imagine with s'mores Yvonne our leader there <laughs> that's true <laughs> yeah and even as adults we definitely had way more than we probably should <laughs> it was great um that's all I have for tonight <laughs>experience I feel like when people are living day to day and their concerns are housing and food it's hard for them to see past it but it is it is yeah <laughs> it makes the work hard other comments or questions yes how many teachers were there for that week 40 yeah, and they're from all over the country, all the way from, I think the furthest was the San Francisco area in California, furthest south was Georgia. There were a number from New York City, which made me really excited to know, uh, to hear from them the kinds of environmental things they're working into the kids' curriculum in the city. Sometimes I feel like better than we're doing, and we have all of this right here. Yeah. What was it that, that you showed at the end? Was it night at that? Yes, yes, it was an eider. Yeah. Any other? Thank you for the scholarship. Thank you for having me. Thank you.